Okay. Um, welcome, everybody, to the 83rd meeting of New Directions in Group Theory and Triangulate Categories. Today, our speaker is Shaka Karmeli from the University of Copenhagen, and he'll be talking to us about cyclotomic redshift. Uh, okay. I can see that I'm not muted, so um, I hope I can be heard. Uh, so today I will talk about uh, cyclotomic redshift. Um, that's a general project aimed at understanding uh, K-theory after chromatic localization and various ways in which it redshifts, namely increase by one the height of various things to which you can assign a canonical height in chromatic homotopy theory. So uh, redshift here is only meant as a word to say increasing height by one. And cyclotomic is maybe just one sample of a chromatic phenomena that comes equipped with a natural notion of height that K-theory is going to increase by one, but it's actually part of a much larger principle uh, that K-theory increase height of things by one, but also anything you can state in terms of the height of chromatic homotopy theory by one as well. Uh, and we will get to make that more precise, of course. So let me first like uh, quickly uh, recall what, uh, what is K-theory. I will only describe it very briefly. So if C is a stable infinity category, uh, we can associate to it a spectrum called the K-theory spectrum. Uh, the precise flavor of it that we are going to use is not going to be um, very important to us because uh, after chromatic localization, they all uh, identify. Uh, and roughly speaking, pi zero at least of the K-theory spectrum of C classifies isomorphism classes of objects, but then we quotient by certain relations that encode possible ways in which an object is glued out of other two objects. So uh, if we have a cofiber sequence and we want to impose that the sum of the two sides is actually the thing in the middle, uh, and one can have other flavors instead of stable infinity categories, one can uh, put in all sort of other types of categories or infinity categories and all other notions that look like cofiber sequences, but that's the one relevant for us uh, today. Uh, and by convention, if R is a ring spectrum, and that's a very historical description of the situation, but for, for the sake of this project, it's very helpful to think that K-theory always wants to eat categories. And if one wants to evaluate it on a ring, what it first uh, do is to produce the category of perfect or compact or dualizable modules over that ring spectrum, uh, and then take the, the K-theory of that category. Of course, historically, K-theory was a thing you assigned to a ring, but uh, it's it will be very useful to think of it as the K-theory of a ring as something that is built out of two independent steps, categorification, and then forcing a category to become a spectrum again by this K-theory construction. Um, right. So uh, one thing to note, like when we have a functor, it's always good to think what's the source, what's the target. So the source is a stable category, but for now we can also think of a ring spectrum, so some kind of a spectrum, and the output is also a spectrum. And that means that like, it would be good to think of both sides in terms of the way we think about spectra. And one thing one can say about spectra is that one can filter them or divide them into pieces uh, given by the chromatic filtration. So let me now just say very roughly what that thing is about, again, from a very ahistorical perspective. So the chromatic homotopy theory is basically about understanding the Balmer spectrum of the sphere spectrum. It's also much more other things that I will not get into talking about today. Uh, and it turned out to look something like that. So there is the rationals, which is like height zero. And then for every classical prime at the points of the spectrum of the integers, there is a whole list of specializations uh, governed by something called the height. And this height, literal height in this diagram, how high you are in this chain, is referred to as the chromatic height. Um, and when we have let's say a ring and we want to understand it in terms of its spectrum and Balmer spectrum here is just really a way to encode something that behave like there's a risky spectrum of a classical ring. It is built out of something that looks like prime ideals. Uh, and then the next thing to do is to localize the ring at a prime and that's like simplifies because now you have a local ring or maybe even complete at a prime or maybe take the quotient and have some kind of a residue field. So the residue field at a prime is something called Morava K theory, which is some kind of a 
periodic version of FP. So from that perspective, the, the homotopy groups of this KN is, is like a periodized version of FP, meaning it's something that wants to encode some kind of a torsion phenomenon. Um, but the periodicity somehow make it look much more like a rational thing from many perspectives that we will get into. Um, and there are two candidates for what does it mean to, to look at like a formal disk around this like residue field. Uh, one of them is starting from the residue field and complete with respect to that. That would be completion uh, at the residue field, and that's the KN lo local sphere. But there is also a way to start from the prime idea itself, th thinking of it as something living in uh, finite spectra, and formally uh, completing at that prime on the categorical level, and let's produce something uh, that is the TN local. Uh, sphere, uh, and and both have like notions of complete modules, which are the TN and the KN local category. Again, uh, that, that might be very uh, imprecise description, but just to get some impression, I'm sure like many of you can say much more than me about those things. Um, but uh, but that's maybe the way I think about them. Uh, and now. We have this K theory, which starts from a ring spectrum that we can think of as something living over this all set of heights and produce another thing. And, and of course, one of the most uh, famous conjectures or principles uh, we had uh, in, 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 in homotopy theory, in chromatic homotopy theory, and in K theory is the redshift. Uh, and this is a principle that uh, was uh, discovered by Asani and Rognes. And as a principle, it says that if R is a, is a ring spectrum of chromatic height n, then k of R should be of chromatic height n plus 1. The quotation mark here is only meant to say there are many different ways in which one can say that a ring spectrum or a spectrum is of specific heights. Uh, and depending on the flavor of what does that mean, there are different ways to interpret that conjecture uh, or principle. Uh, and this is based, uh, as far as I understand, from like an, an evidence for that was given by their computation of uh, quotient of the K theory of the Adam summons uh, by, by P uh, and P1. Um, and uh, one other general evidence for that, so that, that, that uh, this example would be redshifting from uh, height one to height two. Um, and uh, from maybe a simpler but like a larger collection of examples, if R is a discrete ring, which for the purposes of this uh, discussion you should think of as height zero, so let's say a ring in which P is invertible, but it doesn't going to matter. For any discrete ring, if we take the TN localization of the K-theory spectrum of R, it vanishes from height two and above, so it's somehow concentrated in height one, uh, and of course in height zero, rational K-theory is also like so very much a thing. Um, and uh, recently, and very excitingly, uh, a version of this, or an incarnation, a specific choice of off here, uh, have been established recently. So um, this is based on like two different things, proving two different inequalities here. One is the purity result, which is a Altogether, a result of Klaus and Land, Matthew, Mayer, Neumann, Noel, and Tame. Of course, like those are, this is a combination of two different other works, but like combining their works of all those people, one can produce the following result that the TN plus one local K theory of a ring uh, depends only on the localization at TN and TN plus one. So, why is that uh, an incarnation of, let's say, half of the redshift principle? That's because um, if R is, say, local with respect to Tn minus 1, then it's Tn and Tn plus 1 localization are 0. And therefore, right-hand side vanishes. Therefore, left-hand side vanishes. So in that sense, K-theory uh, cannot um, shift the height of something by 2, only by 1. Uh, it actually says much more. It also says that like, if I try to localize with respect to a very small height, that will factor through a further localization. So in some sense, a way to think of it is that, in a sense, the only interesting part of K-theory is the part which keeps the height exactly the same and the part that shifts the height by one up. And everything that goes down actually factors through farther localizing the ring, and everything that goes up is just zero. Um, and uh, the other direction, which is being off height n plus 1 and not height at most n plus 1, is a result of Burkland, Schlank, and Yuan, 
which is a consequence of the chromatic null standard that says that if R is a commutative ring spectrum, uh, TN local ring spectrum, then it's, it's TN plus one local K theory don't vanish. So um, you cannot, you, you necessarily have this one piece, which is height N plus one if you're non-zero, at least in the commutative case. Uh, that's the current uh, knowledge. Uh, and uh, why do I tell you all this? This is not going to be the subject of what we talk about today, but it it's highlights the fact that from chromatic homotopy theory perspective, there, it's very interesting to start with a ring, which is, uh, there, there is like a red circle appearing. What is that? Uh, did I miss anything? Anyway. Um, Sorry, my fault. I didn't ah, know. I, I thought this up. is like a sign to me that I missed something in the formulation or something. <laughs> no, no, sorry. I, I messed up something. <laughs> Great. Okay, awesome. Thank you. Uh, so um, anyway, this highlights the fact that like, okay, if, if K theory cannot increase the chromatic height by, by more than one, it is very interesting to just start with something TN local or maybe like of height up to N, take the K theory and then Tn plus one localize it. That's like, in something like purifying the K theory into seeing only the phenomenon which is like at the edge of what redshift permits, and that's another like kind of a small industry by now of studying properties of Tn plus one local K theory evaluated at rings of height at most n, and that would be like the K theory at the boundary of redshift. And I mean that heuristic now that I'm presenting is really my way to think about it. It doesn't meant to mean anything formal but in my the way i view the things or the things that govern the way i try to say things about it is that in some sense tn plus one local k theory of r is supposed to be some kind of a topological invariant of an underlying topological space you produce out of the spectrum of r so uh, um here is like one example or incarnation of this uh principle so or maybe like Maybe a picture to have in mind, which I don't claim any in any sense is formal, but like you could imagine that you can produce some kind of a site out of spec R using some kind of a growth and topology on R algebras, and then some kind of a locally constant shift of spectra on it whose global sections is the TN plus one local K theory. And in fact, something like that is precisely what happened to K1 local K theory of discrete commutative rings. And part of this fact is that it is indeed a Nepal shift. So if you K1 localize the K theory, uh, functor, then it satis suddenly satisfies a tau descent. It always satisfies a risky descent, but now it's also satisfied a tau descent after K1 localization. Um, so it's some kind of an etal shift, and there is a more precise sense in which, in which you can understand the stocks of that shift and stuff, but let's not get into that. Uh, this fact that K1 local K theory satisfies a tau descent, in particular, one example of a tau descent is Galois descent with respect to group actions. So if you have a Galois extension of commutative rings, uh, then K1 local K theory of that will be a Galois extension of ring spectra if the rings are commutative. Um, and this have a generalization to higher heights, which very, very partially implements this heuristic idea. And this is the fact that, well, it have to be phrased a little different than a tau descent for commutative rings, but it implies something like that. And this is the following more general fact than Galois descent, that TN plus one local K theory, when you restrict it to a so-called LNF local categories, by which I mean infinity cat stable infinity categories, small like the potent complete, whose mapping spectra are LNF local, so concentrated in heights between zero and n, but not necessarily height n on the other height, anything between zero and n. Uh, and then you TN plus one localized K theory. This as a functor on the category of those categories uh, commutes with fixed points with respect to finite P group actions. And that's uh, a theorem of uh, Klaus and Matthew Norman and Noel. That's uh, the theorem is part of one of the two works that imply this purity result I discussed before. Um, that means that uh, homotopy fixed points on the level of the category, after applying K theory, become homotopy fixed points of the K theory spectrum. So there's co assembly map for the homotopy fixed points is an isomorphism whenever the fixed points are with respect to a finite group action on a category. And that's, that's implies by Galois descent for modules, uh, also uh, uh, that TN plus one local K theory takes Galois extensions to Galois extensions with respect to finite P group actions. It's just completely false for non P groups. 
Um, this has to do with the fact that chromatic height is measured at a specific prime, and you don't have to think of a height n category at the prime p as height n in other primes. It's just of different height, height zero. Um, so, um, so that's uh, very nice, and that uh, what I'm going to talk now to describe today first is a generalization of that fact, which generalizes. Uh, the kind of limits that this functor preserves from finite p-group options to more general limits. Um, so that's what we sometimes call higher descent because this previous result was like descent for group actions and we can descend for like uh, homotopically higher limits. Uh, so let me say that uh, space A is pi finite if it have finitely many components and the total homotopy is finite, so finitely many homotopy groups at every point, each of which is a finite group. Uh, and then we prove the following theorem. It's, a, it's everything I say today and uh, from now on is a joint work with uh, Shai Ben Moshe, uh, Tomer Schlank, and Lior Janowski. Uh, and it says that if A is a P local pi finite space, and P locality here is the generalization of being P group, and pi finite space is the generalization of being finite group. So together that's like generalizes finite P group. So it's a space which have only finite p-group as homotopy groups, but I allow pi 2 and pi 7 and also sort of higher homotopy groups. Uh, and every functor from such a space to the category of LNF local categories, which you can think of as, let's say, an action of the finite p-group loop A, except that this group is finite but allowed to have higher homotopy groups, the map from the TN plus 1 local k-theory of the limits identifies with the limit of the TN plus 1 uh, local k theories of the components. So, in other words, uh, the TN plus one local k theory functor from LNF local categories to TN plus one local spectra preserve pi finite p local limits. Um, and uh, it might sound like a kind of a bit of an exotic uh, generalization, but the thing is. Those limits in the world of chromatic homotopy theory play uh, quite an important role. They, they are responsible for all sort of interesting constructions one can do in those categories. And what I'm going to talk about next, apart from outlining the proof of that fact, is consequences of that, and uh, notably consequences which follow from the cases where A is a space with higher homotopy groups and not only uh, the case of finite P groups. So it's really using... Uh, essentially the pi n of the space, in fact. Um, OK, so uh, how this theorem is proven, I will, of course, not describe the whole proof, but I do want to uh, say some things about uh, ingredients that come into the proof of this result. Uh, and like everything is this pi finite chromatic homotopy theory business, the, this, the first thing to do is to uh, filter the concept of a P local pi finite space, you can observe that those spaces always are always truncated. There is like a, uh, the homotopy groups start to vanish starting from some point, and you can induct on this point. And that's a very uh, standard way to proceed when we have a theorem that is like quantified over pi finite spaces. So the first uh, ingredient in the proof is that we are going to use induction on the truncatedness of A of the space A. And here, there's a crucial part. Uh, this theorem might look like a generalization of the result of Klaus and Matthew, Norman and Noel, but it's not, in the sense that we are not reproving the result. We use the result as the base of the induction. And we cannot start one stage before. Our proof simply doesn't work for passing from finite sets to classifying spaces of finite groups. And therefore, like, and th that's something that like come up over and over and over in all this business related to ambidexterity. Somehow there is this phase transition where you have to prove something for finite groups. The proof is somewhat, somewhat uh, I don't want to say complicated. It's a matter of, uh, of taste, but it's of a completely different nature, let's say. And then from there, there is some kind of an inductive argument, relatively formal, that bootstrap the case of classifying spaces of groups to all higher homotopy groups. But you really need to have this first case, and this is what uh, CMNN proved. Um, second thing is that the category of LNF local categories is not really a, a, a good source for, um, uh, for this functor from this perspective. And this is because 
Uh, that's uh, something I haven't talked about at all so far, but like one good thing about the TN local category is that it has something called ambidexterity, namely limits over pi finite spaces and co-limits over pi finite spaces canonically identify. And that's very useful feature. And the category of LNF local categories don't have that feature, but it have a closed relative of monochromatic categories. When mapping spectra be between objects are not LNF local, they're actually at the height n itself. So spectra with vanishing ln minus one F lo uh, localization. And it turns out that by the moment you apply TN plus one local K theory to your category, you can just monochromatize it and it doesn't change the K theory. So one can work equally well with monochromatic categories and get essentially the same functor. But now the category of monochromatic categories happen to be uh, uh, ambidextrous and that's kind of useful because now we can choose at every moment if we want to use limits or co-limits and for different parts of the proof different uh, perspectives are useful uh, and and this identify this this reduction from LNF local to monochromatic uses very heavily the purity result that k theory is only depending on the previous chromatic localization uh, when the category is LNF local uh, so so somehow you can throw away everything which is like all the information which is Ln minus one F local, meaning that you can pass to the monochromatic quotient. Uh, then this advantage of like identifying limits and co-limits allow you to very formally reduce to the case of constant co-limits. So from co-limits over a general functor from A to categories, you can always pass to a functor which is constant. So namely you are thinking about local systems on A, the K-theory of local systems on A compared to the mapping spectrum from A to the K-theory. Uh, and now uh, the next reduction one can do uh, using the Schweller-Shipley uh, theorem and the fact that K-theory preserve filtered co-limits is to assume that our category is a category of modules over a ring. Uh, that's because every stable category is a filtered co-limit of such categories. Uh, and then we end up with what we are actually proving, which is the 10 plus one local K-theory turn the group algebra over loop A into the co-limit, constant co-limit over A. So uh, smashing with the space A on the outside is like taking the group algebra on the inside. Uh, so usually the map from the left and from the right hand side to the left hand side is what is called the assembly map. So what we're proving is that the assembly map also for spaces with higher homotopy groups is an isomorphism. Uh, and now, and here there is like a key ingredient that we learned from, from Akil Matthew, and that was really like a breakthrough in being able to actually prove that result. Uh, so uh, although he is not one of the authors of the paper, he's very much, uh, he was very, very helpful in proving it. Um, so, um, and this is the fact that as a functor of A, now both sides actually preserve the, su the suitable geometric realizations you need to build A from lower truncatedness from spaces of lower truncation level. Namely, on both sides, we can now replace A by the totalization of the bar complex of loop A. Uh, so the space A is always like, it, if it is connected, it's always like a co-limit of, of a diagram expressing it as the B of loop A, which can be written as a certain simplicial co-limit or uh, geometric realization. Um, and the good thing about this is that the right hand side is a co-limit of spaces, each of which have one less homotopy groups, like the highest homotopy group is one, one level lower. Uh, so now if we can show that both sides take this co-limit to the outside, we can now prove that by induction that, that the map, the assembly map is an isomorphism. Uh, on the right hand side, that's more or less by definition, smashing with a space A preserve co-limits in both variables. That's like the characterization of the smash product of spectra. On the left hand side, that's highly non-trivial, but fortunately that's uh, another consequence of the purity theorem and, uh, and the works. Uh, of, uh, that, that have been uh, discussed before, that this functor LTN plus one of K actually preserves geometric realizations in the ring variable. So like it commutes with uh, sifted co-limits, which is a very strong property of this functor. So uh, so that's that, that's basically a description of the entire proof. It's not, I mean, it's not a, a very hard proof uh, in the end, and mostly depending on ambidexterity on this, um, uh, commutation with geometric realizations, not very hard given, of course, many, many other results which are already available. Um, 
Right. So that was about the proof. I mostly told that because I feel like some of those ideas might be relevant as principles for other things. But of course, uh, um, that's kind of technical. Let me pass to uh, discuss uh, some aspects of this or applications uh, of this result. And um, heuristically, one can think of it as saying that this functor, tn plus one local k theory, from categories, uh, from LNF local categories to tn plus one local spectra, it preserves any construction that can be expressed only using pi finite species and the language of limits and colimits. So whenever we have anything that we have constructed, any algebraic feature of those categories, specifically the tn plus one local category, which can be only expressed using this language or constructed from this uh, basic building blocks, K-theory is just expected to preserve them simply because it preserves uh, those co-limits. But it turns out that this principle is pretty useful because there are many interesting constructions in the TN plus one local or TN local K uh, category, which can be built only using by finite limits and co-limits. Um, and the first example of that is the so-called, like, as I'm going to talk about, of course, is, is um, is that of uh, chromatic cyclotomic extensions. Um, and this goes as follows. We start with a very simple pi finite space. Namely, we take the cyclic group on p to the k elements and takes its n-fold classifying space. Um, so that's a space which have pi n equal to cp to the k and no other homotopy groups. The first family of examples of pi finite spaces beyond um, uh, beyond just classifying spaces of groups. These are just the ellenberg maclean spaces. Um, and now I, we can form the group algebra, aka the TN local suspension spectrum of, of, of this space. Uh, but I denote it this way as a group algebra to indicate that this is a commutative ring spectrum because BN CP to the K is actually the underlying space of a spectrum. Uh, so this have a structure of a commutative uh, ring in the TN local category. Um, and then there is a theorem, um, the TN locally, uh, it's, it's, um, again, joint work with uh, uh, Tomer and Lior, that um, this group algebra uh, decomposes as a product of two algebras. One is the group algebra for, uh, for, for the cyclic group of order p to the k minus one. You need to think of those are like co-representing roots of unity, which are secretly of smaller order, although you wanted p to the k roots of unity, you actually get p to the k minus first. That's an example of p to the k's roots of unity. And the other component is the complement. This is like the primitive roots of unity. And like in classical algebra, the primitive roots of unity form a, a cyclic Galois extension for an action of z mod p to the k cross, the, the multiplicative group uh, of, uh, of the cyclic group. Galois extension in the TN local category in the sense uh, of roughness. Uh, so there is a, a notion of Galois extension in, in, in stable homotopy. Uh, theory, and it means this one. Um, and we just call those the chromatic cyclotomic extensions, because if you take n equal to zero, you just get one of the possible constructions of classical cyclotomic extensions for uh, uh, for fields or rings uh, in usual algebra. OK, so this is a construction which depends on n. Of course, it depends on n, because it's like a group algebra over the TN local sphere. But I'm also using, like, Preserving the notation like height n roots of unity adjoined to that to indicate that there is some kind of a built in height to the concept of roots of unity, namely how much the looping we did to the classifying space. And that is a height parameter for the concept of roots of unity, which can be redshifted, and indeed it redshifts. Uh, and that's the next result I want to talk about. This is what we call cyclotomic redshift. And this is why uh, this is the reason for the title of this talk. Um, so, uh, and this is just the, the statement. If we have a TN local, commutative TN local ring spectrum R, we can apply K theory to R with roots of unity assigned to it. That just means tensoring R with the cyclotomic extension of the TN local sphere. Um, or else performing the operations we did before with the TN local sphere, just replacing it by R everywhere. And uh, you can apply TN plus one local K theory to that. Uh, another thing you can do is take the TN plus one local K theory of R and add to it roots of unity now of height N plus one. And those two are canonically identified. Um, so in that sense, 
chromatic cyclotomic extensions or chromatic roots of unity redshifts. They have some notion of height, and TN plus one local K theory preserves the notion except that it shifts the height by one. Um, okay, so that's, uh, and, and, and I mean, given that the construction used only the concept of group algebra, which is a certain core limit, that shouldn't be surprising because the results, the construction used only pi finite core limits to define it. Um, so that's a very immediate consequence of even the constant core limits version of, of, the, of the higher descent result. Uh, and just to mention, the, the case of height equal to zero, namely for classical commutative rings, is actually a result that uh, for me was the entire uh, inspiration for like doing all this uh, stuff. Uh, was just reading the result of uh, Bat, Clausen, and Matthew, which proved uh, the height zero case of that, that K1 local or T1 local, they're of course the same. K theory of a uh, usual, they use the infinite, but you can do, do it also for the finite cyclotomic extension of a, of a commutative ring have the same effect of first tensoring it with KU and then K1 localized. So uh, KU happened to be the infinite cyclotomic extension of uh, the K1 local sphere and uh, after P completion at least, and, and that is uh, I to zero uh, infinite roots of unity version of, of the theorem above. And, and indeed, like the upper theorem is a generalization to higher heights of the, of the lower one. Um, right. Uh, so once you have roots of unity, there is a lot of commutative, further commutative algebra. Excuse one. me. Yes. Um, are you, is there a misplaced parenthesis in that last theorem? Because you're saying that I'm wondering if there should, if the per, the last parentheses should be after R instead of after KU. Is that really what you mean? Uh, you mean on the right? Do you see my mouse? Yes. On here? Yeah, on the right. That's what I mean. Yes. I, I, I'm pretty sure you take the K theory of R, you tensor it with KU, and then you can K1 localize. That's the order of the operations. I hope this is also the order of the parentheses, but. Um, okay, then. So I'm confused. So um, in, oh. the BC, in the in the previous theorem, you're 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 taking the K theory, you're localizing it, and then you're adjoining roots of oh, unity. Oh, right. So on the by right. convention, by convention, adjoining roots of unity is something that implicitly that happen in the TN plus one local category. So I cannot make sense of this notion without TN plus one localizing. So so you need to imagine that on the right hand side you implicitly TN plus one localize everything in the end. But in practice, I just yeah. cannot make the construction without working internally to the TN plus one local category. So, so right hand side is TN plus one local okay. by convention. So like, okay, so the so the BCN theorem is the n equals zero case of your theorem. Is that is that uh, what we're except for like you need to take k to infinity? But yes, they they I'm not sure if they did or they could prove it also for k and and. Those two things for all K and for infinity are actually pretty much the same. So yes, essentially there are, okay. this is like choosing N equal to one, uh, N equal to zero, and we have just generalized that to higher heights. Yes. Okay, thank you. Sure. Um, so once you have the concept of roots of unity, uh, you can start to do all sort of uh, fun algebra that roots of unity permits. Uh, two, one, Example is uh, you can write a Fourier matrix because like Fourier transform is given by a matrix of powers of a root of unity, so why not? And indeed you can do this and uh, you get uh, the chromatic Fourier transform. So let me describe the setup. So we need to start with like a finite abelian group uh, of order divisible by the size of the primitive root of unity you use for the Fourier transform. So the generalization to chromatic homotopy theory is to choose a complex of Z mod P to the K modules, which is concentrated in degrees between zero and N. So if N equal to zero, that would mean just a finite abelian group whose order or whose exponent is divisible by, is dividing P to the K. Um, and we can take the Pontry eigen dual, which is just the home in Z mod P to the K, uh, in the derived category of Z mod P to the K from M to Z mod P to the K, so it takes the homotopy groups to the negative side. Um, and if R is a commutative ring in, in TN local spectra, 
together with a primitive root of unity of order p to the k, which here would just mean a map of commutative algebras from the cyclotomic extension. It can be also stated without the cyclotomic extension as some kind of an element, but for, for us, this is good enough. Um, then uh, there is a Fourier isomorphism that's from a work with uh, Toby Barthel and uh, Joran Pommer. Uh, it says many things, one of which is that there is a Fourier isomorphism between the group algebra of M and a shifted version of the algebra of functions in the dual. So again, there is some parameter N, the shift we have to do for the Pontryagin dual uh, that you can think of as the height of the Fourier transform. And let me just mention this result where R is more of an e-theory is already a result of Hopkins and Lurie from the original ambidexterity paper. Uh, but this uh, is a generalization to TN local category and using only uh, the cyclotomic extension, which is much smaller extension of the unit. Uh, anyway, there is such a Fourier isomorphism, and there is a potential for like redshifting it because it have a parameter n, namely how much you suspend m, and it also have a parameter of a root of unity, which we already know how to redshift. So now it's very natural to ask: Does the Fourier uh, isomorphism compatible with TN plus one local k theory? taking into account the redshift of the roots of unity? And the answer is yes. Uh, so first, let me uh, mention that by cyclotomic redshift, if I have a map from the group algebra, from the cyclotomic extension to R, I can apply TN plus one local K theory, and then the cyclotomic extension redshifts, so I actually get a redshifted map from uh, the, cyclo the height, height N plus first cyclotomic extension back to my K theory. So in some sense, heuristically, K-theory allow you to take a height n root of unity and produce out of it a height n plus one root of unity, which you can think of as like, I don't know, the categorification or redshift uh, of a tower of omega or whatnot. Um, and um, of course, now you can associate with omega Fourier transform. You can also associate with this like uh, new root of unity of Fourier transform. And it makes sense to ask if those are compatible and indeed they are. Uh, so there's a theory, it's, it's, it's um, we proved the following theorem that there is such a commutative diagram. I mean, of course, like you cannot say that the Fourier transform of omega and omega tilde are literally the same. Their source and target are not like the same formula, but there is a very natural isomorphism, both for the source and the target for which the diagram commutes. The isomorphism, uh, on the left is the compatibility of TN plus one local K theory with co-limits. Uh, it might not look like that because there is a suspension M here, but the compatibility with co-limits was not for rings, it was for categories. And modules over the group algebra is the co-limit over, over, over BM. So this isomorphism here secretly uses uh, the higher descent result for co-limits. And on the right-hand side, that's literally the higher descent result for limits, again, um, using a relation between local systems and modules over the co-chain. So, um, but it turns out that taking into account the compatibility with co-limits, limits, and some other identifications that have nothing to do with K-theory, you can produce an isomorphism on the left and on the right, and then there is a commutative diagram. So that's uh, maybe a bit of a technical way to phrase it, but the Fourier transform, the K-theory of the Fourier transform of omega is the Fourier transform of the K-theory of omega. That's what the result says. Um, and B here is for Ben Moshe. So the general rule is if it's something in chromatic homotopy theory, it's with Barthel, and if it's with something about K-theory, it's with Ben Moshe. <laughs> um, okay, so after we have Fourier theory and we have roots of unity, another thing we can do with roots of unity is Kummer theory. Namely, if we have a field with enough roots of unity, uh, one can describe cyclic uh, extensions of it in terms of uh, Galois cohomology, or like in the case of a field uh, f cross mod f cross to the m, where m is, is the order of the root of unity. Um, and, and there are other more complicated versions of, um, of Kummer theory, but importantly, it's something that works when you have enough roots of unity in your base field. Uh, and, and, and the reason is you have to choose a primitive root of unity to define a Kummer isomorphism. So, uh, how Kummer theory works in chromatic homotopy theory, that's what we call higher Kummer theory, or maybe it had another name, I'm not sure, but I would like to call it higher Kummer theory. Uh, and again, you need to fix a p to the case, a primitive p to the case root of unity in R of height n. Uh, 
And now for m of finite z mod p to the k module, which is again allowed to be in, in the range between zero and n, uh, but, it, it, but it already gives an interesting result when m is just a discrete z mod p to the k module. Um, then uh, there is a higher Kummer equivalence between maps from the n-fold suspension of the Pontryagin dual, which again can have now homotopy groups between zero and n to the Picard spectrum of R. Uh, and the space of M Galois extensions of R, which carries a map to the Picard into a certain ring spectrum constructed as some kind of a Tom spectrum construction. Um, so uh, given an element on the left, there is a natural way to construct a Galois extension, uh, namely an element on the right. And the statement is that this is an isomorphism, uh, an equivalence of spaces. Um, and if you specialize to the case where uh, F is a field and N equal to zero, and M is just the group Z mod P to the K, what you get is like maps from Z mod P to the K to pick F, which is like the suspension of F cross. And that's exactly tall one of Z mod P to the K with, with um, sorry, that's exactly going to be F cross mod modulo F cross to the P to the K uh, because, because of the shift in the maps. Um, so uh, so that's higher the higher Kummer equivalent. Um, and uh, here B is Barthel, because that's something that doesn't have K-theory in it. Um, and once again, this, this is something with, which, which potentially can redshift, because there is like a param height parameter, which is how much you have to suspend M-dual M, M for the Kummer equivalence. Uh, and now, how do these redshifts incarnate? Well, one needs to first explain how a Kummer class, namely a map from suspension, M of M, suspension N of M-dual, to the Picard spectrum of R, give rise to a Kummer class for the K-theory, which now will be a map from suspension n plus one of M star. But that's uh, that's just a very standard construction, namely uh, the Picard spectrum of R uh, give rise to units of the K-theory. Every Picard class is an invertible module. In particular, it's a module, so it gives a class in K-theory which happen to be invertible. So there's a natural map from pick R to the units of the K theory of R. And when we have and a map from suspension N of M dual to the K theory of R, you can the loop to a map from suspension N plus one of M dual to the pick R of the K theory. Now suspension N, N, N plus one of M dual is going to not have a bottom homotopy group. So, so it's fine. There, there exists such, you can, you can construct such a map. There is no obstruction on pi zero. Um, so, um, so there is a way to assign to such a map. Such a map, again, it is basically the things that think of uh, element of peak R as an invertible element of the K-theory. Um, so now there is a question one can rise. What is the relation between the Kummer, the Kummer extension associated with F and the Kummer extension associated with F tilde? And the answer is that they match up. And that's, again, another... Uh, ingredient of this cyclothermic redshift that PN plus one local K theory is compatible with Kummer theory. It takes the, the Kummer extension of uh, F tilde is the K theory of the Kummer extension of F. So that's, um, and here again, uh, B is for uh, Ben Moshe. So uh, this is the end of uh, the kind of compatibilities or redshift incarnations uh, that K-theory has that we have proven. But I would like to say here that for me, it's absolutely not the end of the story. This is just happened to be the amount of uh, field arithmetic or commutative algebra that have been implemented using pi finite limits and co-limits in chromatic homotopy theory. And it's just entirely compatible with K-theory. So I would expect that much more things from classical algebra can be constructed in chromatic homotopy theory using pi finite spaces and then being proven to be compatible with K-theory. But I just, that's just the amount of those things I know of at the moment. Um, so I, I really don't think that's the end of what can be done using this method. Uh, yes, there's a question? No, no. Oh, okay. Um, okay, so, uh, this is it in terms of uh, implementing this principle that uh, you construct algebraic things in the TN local category using pi finite co-limits, and then you use the fact that K-theory is compatible with those limits and co-limits to prove that K-theory takes those constructions 
to themselves shifted by one. Um, the next application is some kind, somehow of a completely different flavor. Uh, so um, the fact that, uh, so that's about cyclotomic hyperdescent. So um, in general, PN plus one local K theory satisfied the send with respect to finite P group extensions. And a natural question to ask is what happened when we have infinite Galois extensions, like the entire cyclotomic, uh, the infinite cyclotomic extension or the entire Lubin Tate extension of the KN local sphere, which is Morava E theory. Um, and given that you have finite Galois extension, the question whether you preserve infinite Galois extension is a question about something that is usually called hyperdescent, namely K theory already defined on a tau chief, does it define on a tau hyper chief? And without getting into those technical definitions, that's about K theory being compatible with pro finite Galois extensions as well. And the descendability with respect to pro finite Galois extensions and end up being extremely closely related to the nature of the TN local and the KN local categories. In fact, now we, all, we know that that's all the difference. If you just impose, uh, so, I mean, you can just, well, maybe I said uh, something not very precise here, but um, the, question, uh, uh, the question of hyper descent of things with respect to uh, pro-finite Galois extensions turn out to be a fundamental difference between the TN local and the KN local category, as we will talk about soon. So one can form the cyclotomic tower, which is obtained by just putting one after the other, the cyclotomic extensions. There are natural maps between them, equivariant with respect to ZP cross. And you can just take the co-limits. And this co-limit, of course, TN localized, is the infinite cyclotomic extension. So uh, the infinite cyclotomic extension is a pro Galois extension, which is nothing but saying it is a co-limit of finite Galois extensions with respect to the finite quotients. So that's no information. Like when it basically tells you nothing beyond the fact that those Galois extensions map to each other. Uh, but there is something highly non-formal here, although very fundamental to chromatic homotopy theory. And this is the fact that after KN localization, this Galois extension actually, this pro-Galois extension become genuinely a Galois extension with respect to the pro-finite group. Technically speaking, that means that tower defines a hypershift over the site of finite ZP cross sets. But without getting into this technicality, here there is an easy way to state that. Choose a topological generator of the group ZP cross. From now on, P is odd. Uh, it doesn't matter at all. And take the fixed points with respect, the usual homotopy fixed points of its action on the infinite cyclotomic extension. This is actually going to be the KN local sphere. And that's basically a consequence of the fact that Morava E theory is an algebraic closure of the KN local sphere, which is genuinely a Morava stabilizer group Galois extension of the KN local sphere. And for quite a while, it was there was a feeling or a sense that this should be a fundamental feature of the KN local category, which is absent from the TN local category. So, like, it's standard for, for some time whether the same is true for. Uh, for the TN local category, that the maximal cyclotomic extension is actually a uh, faithful infinite, infinite Galois extension of the TN local sphere. It's just pro Galois in that weak sense of being like an, an assembly of many finite Galois extensions. Um, and, uh, con uh, but, but for now, a consequence of the fact that KN locally, this is correct, if you put it together with cyclotomic redshift, you get the following result uh, that uh, for TN local ring spectrum R, you can associate, you can uh, adjoin to it infinitely many P roots and then take the fixed points for a topological generator uh, of the P cross. And this is just the K theory of R itself. So, um, so, uh, regardless of the question whether like the source is a faithful Galois extension of R or not, after applying K theory and then KN plus one localizing, it become a faithful Galois extension. Um, and, and one can say that as saying that the functo KN plus one local K theory satisfies hyper descent. It actually satisfies more. It might potentially take a non, uh, 
a, a pro Galois extension to a actual Galois extension, which means it's actually improving it. But if you think of it, for example, as a functor from KN local ring spectra, then what that say is that this functor satisfies hyperdescent for the cyclotomic tower. It doesn't mean it's satisfied for all extensions, and in fact, this happened to be false. But but in the case of but this in this key example of like a pro finite Galois extension, it satisfies this hyperdescent feature that you can compute the k-theory of the base by taking the fixed point of the k-theory of the top of the tower. Now, why is that? Uh, why, why, why do we care about that statement? Uh, well, uh, one reason is because of its relevance for the telescope conjecture. So let me now uh, briefly discuss that. So uh, this is all now, uh, of course, starting to uh, be about the, the work of uh, Brookland, uh, of Robert Brookland, uh, uh, Jeremy Han, Ishan Levy, and Thomas Schlank. And uh, let, let me denote by BPN the n truncated brown common spec uh, Peterson spectrum, so some decompleted version of Morava E theory, if you like. Um, but it's just obtained from BP by uh, quotioning out all the too high uh, generators in the homotopy of too high height. Um, and then there is a fact that they prove in their uh, in their work about the telescope conjecture that one can put a Z action on this BPN or, or a, let's say a suitable multiplicative form of it in such a way that more or less taking the fixed points and mapping it to the actual thing is an infinite cyclotomic extension. It's not quite true, but it is true that after you tensor both sides with cyclotomic extension, that becomes a composition of a finite P extension and a split extension. So up to finite P Galois extensions, this is correct, which would suffice for the next statement. Uh, a consequence of that and the hyper descent, so now we can base change to uh, infinite cyclotomic extension. This is safe because of hyper descent, because of cyclotomic hyper descent. And then we are only dealing with like finite Galois extensions, which are fine by the, uh, by the result of CMNN. So this implies that from the perspective of KN plus one local K theory, the K theory of BPN behaves as if um, satisfy hyper descent as well. So the K theory with respect to the power BPN HZ mapping to BPN after TN localization, but it doesn't matter because we took like KN plus one local K theory, so we can might as well TN localize. Uh, satisfies hyper descent in the sense that like the base, which is BPN fixed points by Z, its K-theory is actually the fixed points of the K-theory on the top of the tower, also for this uh, version of the cyclotomic extensions that they construct. Um, so if you like, if you don't like all those technicalities, you can take n equal to 2, and then that's literally a cyclotomic extension over its base. Uh, and what that thing says is precisely cyclotomic hyperdescent. Uh, on the other hand, quite amazingly, they can prove that this is just TN plus one locally false. So they have proven in their uh, recent preprint about the telescope conjecture that if you look at the same assembly map TN plus one locally or equivalently after uh, integrally, but after tensoring with uh, uh, type N plus one complex and inver uh, type N, N plus one complex and inverting VN, VN plus one, uh, this map is now actually uh, not an isomorphism. It's 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 an understatement. It's very much not an isomorphism. Namely, the source is huge compared to the target, and this map is a quotient by lots of stuff. Uh, of course, well, k n plus one locally, you have a certain isomorphism. You replace k n by t n, and certain, suddenly you don't have an isomorphism. That of course contradicts the telescope conjecture for height n greater than or equal to two, because secretly I had to use ppn for n greater than or equal to one. So that's uh, the connection uh, between their work on the telescope conjecture and uh, cyclotomic redshift. So uh, I just wanted to mention that as well. Um, and yes, I think I not only finished saying what I had to say on time, but even I have like two minutes left for extra questions, I guess. So thank you very much uh, for uh, attending. Uh, and giving me the opportunity to speak here. It is a great pleasure and honor. Thank you, Shekha. Um, let's all give Shekha a round of applause.
Right, so the usual. If you have any questions for the speaker, ask them now. Okay, uh, nice talk, um, Shahar. Thanks. So for the Coomer extensions, uh, can you maybe walk through an example of where you've identified the, I, I guess, you know, you have this equivalence, but an example where maybe you can describe the Coomer extensions produced by a choice of M in another way? Um, yes, unfortunately, I have an example a, a bit silly. So, you know, if you add a p squared root of unity, that's like a Coomer extension of what you get from adding a p root of unity. So in, in a sense, knowing like the cyclotomic redshift through Coomer theory tells you that cyclotomic redshift for the p cyclotomic extension implies it for the p squared cyclotomic extension. You can say that's a bit of a silly example, like there are more interesting examples of uh, uh, Coomer extensions. And unfortunately, I didn't work out, um, I'm embarrassed to say I didn't work out that many examples. In particular, you know, one example you can give is, okay, sure, now you can compute the K-theory of like, I don't know, uh, you take UP, you add to it like p roots of unity and then add like a p root of some random element, then it, it will give you an answer of what that thing is. Um, but I don't know the Kummel class of almost any other higher Galois extension. In particular, I would really love to know the Kummel classes of all sorts of other extensions of the cyclotomic extension in chromatic homotopy theory and then say like, oh, I know the K-theory of that in a sense. I didn't work out any of those. So it's it's a very interesting question to do. Like take, you know, any P squared extension of the cyclotomic extension of, of the K and local sphere, compute the Kummel class in some sense, and then you get an interesting example of what K theory, of an explicit Galois descent for chromatically localized K theory out of that. Uh, but I, I don't have any concrete example of this form that I worked out, unfortunately, mm -hmm. but it sounds very exciting to me. If it can be done. Yeah, yeah, it's an interesting question. Anyway, thanks. Thank you, Jay. Any other comments or questions? Did someone write something in the chat? Oh, some thank yous. Yeah. All right. Uh, I mean, of course, we only got a definite answer about the V1 homotopy of K theory of PP1, but uh, because we were using power operations and, and street commutativity, but we did also carry out calculations, sort of assuming that PPN existed as a sufficiently commutative ring spectrum and that these Smith-Toda complexes existed, that we could also see that you would then get that the algebra would carry through to get Vn plus one periodicity uh, in the K theory of PPN, but in you know in, in in, in practice, uh, those hypotheses were not actually satisfied because BP is simply not E infinity and so on. But I, I just want to say, I mean, there was kind of, you know, more evidence than just the height one to two case uh, uh, in the private notes, but but even if it didn't actually appear in print. But anyway, great, fantastic talk. Thank you very much. Uh, let me just relate to that. I mean, that's fantastic. And I you know for, for me, that's like the, the height one case is also already like, sufficiently miraculous that like I certainly would like to understand it better but uh, indeed like there is a huge complication that I completely didn't talk about partially because I'm absolutely not an expert on on what happened when you pass from n equal one to higher ends and this is exactly the fact that like PPN is at most like an E3 algebra and if you want to take the Z action that is needed into account, I think the best that is known is like E1 times A2 or something. And it's barely suffices, but it suffices. Uh, the thing is that like Galois extensions happen to be extremely uh, um, rigid objects that like if you can show that a map, the Tatian local map is like a Galois extension of E1 rings, it's automatically, and the source, like the source is infinity, also the target. So like, I certainly didn't talk about that, but of course there is tremendous amount of work in substantiating this description of like the uh, BHLS work. I, um, I, but that was like only the connection of that to, uh, to cyclotomic redshift. But of course to actually substantiate that and make that precise requires dealing with all those difficulties, certainly. And they do quite impressively.
uh, and in a way that I don't fully understand, of course. Oh, we have time. Yes. Oh, just for the BP2 computation, I mean, I have a paper with uh, Angelini, Knoll, and Osoni, and uh, Herning, and Culver that will be push, push the V2 periodic, I mean, we compute the V3 periodic homotopy of K3 or BP2. But that's, but that's with that, that's just at the top of the Gal of the of the Galois extension. It doesn't provide the uh, the actual extension. Right. But, uh, uh, yeah. It, a crucial part of their work, of course, is the fact that that you can compute the K theory of the fixed points of C. I think the the other side of the map is already K and plus one local. That is proven uh, using the. Uh, yeah, yeah. One of those I mean, filtrations uh, they are using on TC that I don't remember the name of. So like this comparison map, the target is not a good candidate for the telescope conjecture. It's only the source. Uh, so this was really crucial step to be able to deal with the H fix for Z fix points. Yeah, yeah. Right. Um, no, I'm just talking about 25 years ago here. No, but actually, I, I, actually, it's kind of related since Doug is perhaps still here. Um, I mean, there, there, there was a. I mean, there's this issue about whether this is redshift or blue shift. And I think I actively at some point decided that the grading should correspond to wavelength rather than frequency. So that, uh, you know, higher height should correspond to longer wavelengths. And that's why it should be red rather than, I mean, if you had thought about it as, as frequency, then it would, have been a, it would have been a blue shift. But I, I think I decided that while well, higher chromatic heights are sort of harder to detect, so they should correspond to lower energy and be harder to you know, less less easy to detect somehow. So that's somehow why I wanted to think about it as as redshift. But 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 uh, I, mean, I, I think Doug, I mean, I think you had both kind of color and musical notes in mind. I mean, there, uh, there is a good bit of the chromatic terminology that works with things like harmonic and dissonant that are more mm -hmm. about sound than um, than color. But um, Sure well, I like any... the choice you. I like the choice you made between redshift and blue shift. I think you made the right choice. It's. I like it. Yeah, yeah. I didn't actually say blue shift, but there was this work on uh, earlier work on on Tate constructions, which sort of in hindsight then got labeled blue shift. But I don't think the name. I mean that that came afterwards at some point. Anyway, this is yeah. long ago. Anyway, mm -hmm. this is it's it's extremely fun to see how these things work out. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, John. Any. Further comments or questions? Right. Well, in that case, um, let's thank the speaker once again. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Um, we are scheduled to have we're scheduled to have last winter Christmas in next week. So yeah, I hope to see you there. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you.